Is that working? <clears throat> Excellent connection. Looks like it might be working. Move that around. Bear with me. Get this figured out. Uh huh. Looks good. Um, got my YouTube going. Got this pen and paper. You can see the screen, and you can see. Me. Hello, anybody who's watching. Um, hopefully the audio quality is a bit better on this one. I've got a fancy new mic. Um, give it a wee tap there. Hopefully you can hear that. Um, if anybody's watching live, welcome. If you're watching in future, I hope you enjoy it. Um, I'm going to be going through a general navigation practice exam. Um, doing 55 questions. It's what um, I've found out is the length of the exam. I think you get two hours and 15 minutes, was it, from memory. Uh, but I'm not going to time myself, I'm just going to do it freestyle. And um, hopefully we'll finish near enough that because that's going to be a long stream otherwise. Um, I've got pen and paper for some rough working and drawing the effing picture. I have a calculator to do some calculations on. I think you should be able to see that um, if I get the light right. Yeah, so I'll tip it down. And then I've got a CRP5 for doing all the calculations and a little pencil as well to use with the CRP5. And uh, the usual disclaimer at the start, um, I'm going to make mistakes, but it's important to make the mistakes now rather than making them during the exams and learning from them. So we'll take a look at the end of everything that I uh, messed up on, basically. So we'll get rid of my face. Uh, where are you? There. So you can see the pen and paper. You can see the screen and we'll click start test. General navigation, all topics, show the answer after the choice. 55 questions, I'm going to do random. Let's go. Oof, 55 questions, here we go. Okay. So, question one. The orbit of the Earth uh, the orbit of the Earth around the Sun is around the Sun. Uh, around the Sun is a circle with the Sun at its centre. No, it's not a circle. It's a um, ellipse. The Sun around is an ellipse with the Sun at one of the foci. It's looking good. Is a circle? Nope. Is around the Sun, uh, and it's an ellipse with the Sun at a point halfway between the two foci. Um, B. Yeah, a little picture there, we can see. Um, all right, pictures are showing up a bit strange. So if I come in to here and select the window, does that mean then I can shift it across? Yes, I can do that for showing images. Basically, that's what it's saying. Makes sense. Now we'll try knock it back so it's about there. Cool. What is the correct definition of latitude of a position on the Earth? Latitude is the angle between the Earth's rotational axis and the line from the centre of the Earth to the position. Latitude is the angle between the plane of the equator and the line from the centre of the Earth to that position. Latitude is the angle between the plane of the ecliptic and the parallel of the position. 
latitude is the angle between the plane of the prime meridian and the plane of the meridian position. So latitude is the angle between the Earth's rotational axis and the line from its centre to um, latitude is the angle between the plane of the equator line of the prime of the parallel of the position. Oh, this is quite weird actually. Latitude is the angle between the Earth's rotational axis, so the vertical axis, a line between this and, the, and a line from the centre of the Earth to the position. So it would be this, but that's not quite right because we're looking for this angle. So not A. Latitude is the angle between the plane of the equator, yes, and a line from the center of the Earth to that position. B is looking good. Latitude is the angle between the plane of the ecliptic. No, because that's offset, because we on Earth are angled in towards um, or away from the Earth, so that's going to be wrong. Um, and latitude is the angle between the plane of the prime meridian and the plane of the meridian of the position, so I think it's B. Yes. Sometimes the wordy ones you just have to think about a bit more in depth because getting the words wrong and then you're you're humped. Anyway, next question. Given a true air speed of 205, a heading of 180 and a wind velocity of 240 at 25, calculate the drift and the ground speed. Okay, so time for the first of probably many CRP5 questions. Just grab something up here. So, CRP5, hopefully you can see it there if I angle it down towards the light. Yeah, cool. Um, so, if we've got the wind on a CRP5, we do that first. And we do. So, wind 240 at 25. So, let's get that in there. 240 is there and 25 knots is there. And then we slide up to the true speed, 205 knots. That's it on 205. And then we turn to the heading of 180. Where are you? 180 over here. So on a heading of 180, it looks like our drift is 6 degrees to the left. And our ground speed is 194. Is there anything that looks like that? For, uh, yes, D, 6 degrees to the left, 194. Bosh. Next one. <clears throat> Parallels of latitude except the equator are both rum lines and great circles, neither rum lines or great circles, rum lines, great circles. So parallels of latitude except the equator. So they're not great circles as soon as they leave the, leave the equator because it starts off and then that's a great circle there, but this one isn't and this one isn't and this one isn't. So if it says great circle and great circles, no. Great circles, no. Neither rum lines nor great circles or rum lines. They are rum lines because if you follow them, um, follow them purely east or purely west, you don't have to change direction at all um, between two points that are on the same line of Line, same parallel of latitude, sorry. So I'm going to go C, rum lines. The equator, so the explanation just behind the page says the equator is both a great circle and a rum line, yet all other parallels of latitude are rum lines only, although they are also small circles. All meridians are both great circles and rum lines. Okay. On a Lambert conformal conic chart, great circles are not <clears throat> Excuse me. On a Lambert conformal conic chart, great circles that are not meridians are 
So great circles that are not meridians. So lambda is conformal conic. You can give it the sort of triangular shape with lines going up to the top where that's north. If we draw a straight line on it, it's a great circle and a rum line will be closer to the equator and that'll be curved. Right, so now we've got a picture, of, let's see what it's saying. Lambert's conformal conic. Great circles are that are not meridians. Not meridians are straight lines regardless of distance. distance. Curves concave to the pole of projection straight lines within the standard parallels, curves concave to the parallel of origin. Straight lines within the standard parallels sounds about right. No, curves concave to the parallel of origin. Ah, okay. So, um, what's the best way to show this actually? If I just go over here and close this, yeah, okay. So, Whilst for practical purposes, on a Lambert chart, we draw great circles as straight lines. In reality, they are lines concave to the parallel of origin. They're slightly concave, but for practical purposes, we draw them straight. So, a bit of a dud question. But anyway, another CRP5, calculate the drift and ground speed. So, uh, true air speed, wind velocity, and heading. So if we've got wind, we do that first. I've got this very cool electric eraser here, so I can just quickly buzz these out. Uh, very nice. Um, wind velocity, 0 0.35, 0 0.35, and 45. 45 is here. Then we go to the true speed, 250 knots, 250 knots. This thing can be a bit hard to do unless you slam it on the table or something, so bear with me. 250 knots. And then a heading of 029. Heading 029 is just there. And that looks like a drift of only one degree with a ground speed of 204. One degree to the left and 204. 205 for option C, close enough. There we go. Next option. Check if anybody's. Well, there are people watching live. Welcome. Um, cool. Let's go back. Sorry, I'm, I'm just concerned that the audio might not be good because of the last stream, the audio was crap. Um, so I'm just double checking every so often to make sure that the audio is okay. If it is okay and somebody was watching live, please give me a shout. Um, just give me a thumbs up or something. Anyway, back to the task at hand, the actual doing of the exam. So what is the approximate scale at 22 degrees north on a direct mercator chart if the scale at 35 degrees north is 1 to 200,000? So with scales, the easiest thing to do is think of it as ABBA. So ABBA, ABBA, and you go with the scale at A, um, times the cosine of B equals the scale of B times the cosine of A. So a scale of scale A, okay, is one to two hundred thousand. That's one over two hundred thousand times cosine B. We're looking for that, which is twenty-two degrees north at twenty-two degrees north. So cosine 22. Scale at B, that's the thing we're looking for. And at cosine of A would be 35. Okay, so 
do that calculation. So we've got 1 over 200,000 times cosine 22. So we do cosine 22 divided by 200,000, right? And then we divide that by cosine 35 because we're bringing that down and across. And we get an value which is pretty mad, which is, excuse me, um, we can minus one that, can't we? And get 152527, I think that's it, is it? Doesn't seem right. Hmm. Okay, let's try again without doing the one to two, one over. Let's just go 200,000 times cosine 22. And then divide that by cosine 35. 226. See, that's there, but I feel like you've got to do 1 over. See, we'd end up with cosine 22 over that. I know. Why was I getting confused there? Let's um, read the explanation, shall we? Um, we get rid of you. So um, this question is testing your knowledge of what's known as the ABBA equation. Okay, I was right. So distance, blah, 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 blah. The easier to draw a diagram like this. Cosine, scale distance, four cells highlighted in bold. Three of the cells are figures and the fourth is an answer you need. Two, two, six, three, seven, five. Okay, so I was right. Anyway, looks okay. Oh, Martin commented. Hi, I watched the videos prepared for in my Gina of Mag. Thank you. You're very welcome, Martin. That's what it's all about. Um, I'm glad you're finding them very useful. Anyway, sorry, I keep checking the stream just in case there's any issues. Um, let's go to the next question. I've got to crack on with these questions for a bit. The main reason that day and night throughout the year have different duration is due to the Earth's rotation, gravitational effect of the sun and moon on the speed of the rotation of the Earth, inclination of the ecliptic to the equator, relative speed of the sun along the ecliptic. So it's the tilt of the Earth. So the inclination, the tilt, of the ecliptic, the ecliptic plane is the... Um, like the orbital plane to the equator, actually the equator that's incl inclined to the ecliptic, but see. Position A, position B, for the route from A to B, the uh, run line distance is this, great circle direction is this, run line distance is this, great circle. So we're either working out the run line distance or the great circle. So we'll do the run line distance first because that's departure. Um, departure, the equation for that, we use the um, change in longitude. We multiply that by 60 to get the distance in nautical miles at the equator. And then we multiply that by the cosine of the latitude and get like a factor of how much smaller it is. So let's just do that. So departure, depth. Oop, I've hit a miss thing. There we go, departure equals the change in long times 60 times the cosine of the uh, average latitude. In this case, it's the same, which is 30. And the change in longitude, we can use our calculator very easily. 175.23.2 west to position B, which is east. We're going over the anti-meridian. So we're going to go up towards 
180 degrees west and then back down. So the easiest way to do that is probably to take the um, value 180, take away the westerly value 175 degrees, 23.2 minutes. We get 436.48. 436.48 and then we do the same with the other side and add the two together so 180 take away 173 48.1 and we get 61154 which we can add on 436 48 and that's a value of 10 degrees 48 minutes and 42 seconds and we can multiply that by 60 and we get a value of uh, what's that going to be yeah 648.7 multiplied by cosine 30 Sorry, um, cosine 30, and you get 5. Do, 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 do. Is it going to make it for us? So that's going to be 561 um, and 47. So you think about if it's base 60.1 equals um, 6 of these minutes, so 48 would be 0.8 because 8 times 6 is 48. Hopefully I've explained that in a way that makes sense. So run line distance looks like it's 462 knock miles, which would be option C. Yes, cool. A great circle track joins position A, 56 south, 141 west, and uh, position B, 61 South 140 US, how does the true track change when flying from position A to position B? So we are going to draw the effing picture because that's what we do. Position A is in the south and position B is further south. Position A is west and position B is further west. So position A starts off over here for example, um, I'm going to draw it on a, doesn't give us what chart it is, but if it's a great circle, I'm going to draw a straight line and I want to draw that on something that makes sense, so it's going to be a Lambert's chart I'm going to use. So it's southern hemisphere, so north is up towards the top here and south is a common point down here. This is 59 degrees south and 141 degrees west. B is 61 degrees south, so it's further down here, and 148 degrees west, so it's further west. This drawing is making sense. North up here, in both these examples. And B is here, 61 degrees south, and 148 degrees west. Straight line between the two is a great circle. How did the true track change when flying from position A to position B? So it's saying what happens when this angle compared to this angle. So we can see just from our drawing that the angle at position B is larger than A. So I'm gonna say it increases. And then we need to work out the convergency of uh, this. So convergency on A Lambert's chart is the change in longitude times the sine of the parallel of origin or the sine latitude or in this case it would be the average latitude because we don't have a parallel of origin. So the average latitude between these two is 60. And the change in longitude between the two, 48 to 41, is 7 times sine 60, uh, where are 
be sine 60 multiplied by 7 and we go 6 degrees 6 degrees so it's looking like it's a it increases by 6 degrees and the picture that's been drawn here if I once again hide this thing that's exactly what we've drawn Um, sorry, I was just having troubles. An aircraft started at 13.58 and passed a fixed 59 nautical miles from the starting point at 14.29. The distance to the left, distance left to the destination is 78 nautical miles. And the ground speed is said to be constant along the flight. So we're working at the ground speed and then we're using that ground speed to tell how far we've covered. So we're, how far along? 59 nautical miles speed distance time calculations and 1358 until 1429 is 30 uh, 1, 32, 33 minutes 2 plus 29, oh no 31 minutes what am I talking about 2 minutes takes us to yeah exactly 31 minutes there we go um, and we're covering 59 miles, and then we've got 78 not 78 miles to go. So speed equals distance over time. Speed equals the distance 59 over the time 31 minutes. So we can do uh, 59 divided by, and you can use this little button again. 59 divided by it's zero hours, but it's 31 minutes and you can get it as 114 knots um, and then we use that speed in the next one so 114 equals 78 time time 78 divided by this 41 minutes pretty much so plus 41 minutes on to 1429 that's 1430 then it's 1500 then it's 1510 so that's a yes You're on an airfield, elevation 2,000 feet, QNH 1003. You want to climb to flight level 50. Your rate of climb is 1,000 feet a minute. Your TAS is 100 and you have a headwind of 20. What's the distance it takes to get to flight level 50? Okay, so there's a bit going on here. Um, QNH is 1003. And we're at 2,000 feet, so that is a starting point. 2,000 feet, and the Q and H for that is 1003. This is our starting point here. You want to climb to flight level 50. So flight level 50 is based off of 1013, which will be lower down today. So 1013 is going to be 10 hectopascals lower down 10 times 27 or 30 if you want 27 is a little bit more accurate is 270 feet that's every hectopascal we go down is every hectopascal is a change of 27 feet so if we're going down to 1013 10 times 27 270 feet so then if we want to climb up to flight level 50 we're actually climbing up to 5,270 feet. Okay, 
So flight level five zero equals 5,270 feet. So this is what we're trying to do in here. I know it's not to scale, but yeah. Your rate of climb is 1,000, your TAS is this, and you have one of this. So we're actually looking to climb 5278 minus 2,000. 3270 feet is what we want to cover. And then we've got a equation that we can use where we've got the ground distance, ground speed, time, and the verticals as well. So 327, 3270 is our vertical. 3270 is vertical. Try and remember that. So the ground distance, GD, over the ground speed, times 60, equals time, which also equals the altitude change over the vertical speed. So the ground distance that we want to cover is what we're trying to find out. Cool. GD. Ground speed. So our, we're climbing, which means we need to take the average at two thirds. We don't have to worry about that. That's fine. So the ground speed in this case is the true air speed plus any wind component. Wind component is a headwind of 20 knots, so it's going to slow us down. So our ground speed is 80 knots. It was 100, take the 20 off because we're going slower. Multiply that by 60 to give us a time value. And then that equals the altitude change, which I know I said I'd remember, but of course I've forgotten. 3 to 70 feet. 3 to 70 with a vertical speed 1000. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to work out the time from this and then do this this side of the equation first and then work in this side of the equation. So our time equals 3270 right well it's just going to be yeah anyway 3.27 Okay, and then we use that in this value. So ground distance over 80 times 60 equals 3.27. We'll divide that by 60 and get ground distance over 80 to equal 3.27 divided by 60, 0 0.0545. Multiply that by 80, get the ground distance. Four point three six. Uh, four point four. No. What have I done? Airfield pressure altitude two thousand three hundred. Okay, so they've done it the other way around. Two thousand seven hundred feet to reach flight level five zero. Hmm. Ah, right. Because we're reach, we're wanting to reach the exact flight level of five zero, not five thousand two hundred seventy feet, like I've said. So we actually have to apply. We have to think of the airfield altitude. Okay, that's yeah, that makes sense. There you go. You've we've learned something. So this is what. So I came in here. Ooh, can I show you that again? Yes. So I came in here and I took this down, but that was wrong. We want to we still want to climb up to five zero, flight level five zero. But you can see the ten times thirty they've used instead of twenty seven, and they're applying that altitude to the airfield elevation. Okay. Cool cool cool. declination of the sun is defined as the so declination is like celestial latitude I like to think about so arc along the celestial sphere from the zenith to the sun it sounds so science fiction and cool doesn't it celestial sphere from the zenith to the sun um, the angular distance of the sun north to south of the celestial equator. 
celestial latitude kind of vibes there. See an arc from the celestial horizon to the sun measured along the vertical line perpendicular to the horizon. Um, celestial horizon to the sun. Declination of the sun measured along a vertical line perpendicular to the horizon. But it's not an arc of the meridian of the sun measured from the nearest pole to the sun. It's not that one. So C or B. I think it's just north or south of the celestial equator. Yeah. Celestial attitude. Keep it simple. <laughs> A Lambert's conformal conic chart whose standard parallel is 54 and 59 is used for navigation. A straight line from A to B is drawn on the chart. The true course of the straight line track drawn on the chart. The true course of the straight line track drawn on the chart at B is. Okay, draw a picture. Um, standard parallels is basically going to allow us to find out the parallel of origin and get our convergency from that. So a straight line from A to B is drawn on the chart. When the northern hemisphere we're going from 165 east to 145 east very east to not as much east so a is 53 degrees north a is over here 53 degrees north and 165 degrees to the east we're then traveling to b which is 58 degrees north and 145 degrees east. We're in the northern hemisphere, so the lines point up like this to north up here somewhere. Straight line is drawn on the chart. Straight-ish line is drawn on the chart. And the true course of the state line track is 301, so this angle in here, 301 degrees, and it is wanting to know what this angle in here is. So what we're going to do is find out the convergency and then it looks like we're going to subtract it from the chart here. So convergency equals the change in long. So 165 to 145 is 20. And then from, then we multiply that, sorry, by the sign of the parallel of origin parallel of origin in this case we're not given we've got to figure it out so it's going to be 54 plus 59 divided by 2 which I'm just going to do on the calculator because it'll be quicker than my head 54 plus 59 divided by 2 56.5 56.5 sign of that equals that multiply by 20 and that is how much the angle will change by 16.7 degrees, let's call it. Um, and we can see 301, it looks like it's going to be smaller, just from our diagram. So 301 minus this, and um, there's no points, let's just call it 17 then. The answers have no decimal places, that's why I'm rounding. So 301 minus that. 284 degrees. Option A. Yeah, explanation exactly how I said. The following information is for an aircraft in the cruise at 1150 UTC. What will be the ground speed? Okay, UTC 1150, bit of a curveball there. I don't think that's very necessary. Track direction. Temperature, calibrated airspeed. Okay, so what are we trying to find out? The ground speed. So we need to work out the true airspeed, and we've got calibrated airspeed. We're going to work out the true airspeed, okay, and then put it into the wind. So we're using both sides of our CRP5 calculator here. Um, first thing to do is go figure out the ISA temperature at flight level 80 and then we can figure out what ISA plus 10 is. So sea level is 15 degrees and for every 1000 feet we drop by 2 degrees 
So at flight level 80, it's going to be 16 degrees colder. Yep, so that's going to be minus 1 all the way up there. 8 times 2, you know, 16, and we take that off. Yeah, so minus 1 degrees is the ISA temperature at flight level 80. But it's ISA plus 10, which means that the temperature at flight level 80 is 9 degrees. Right, so we're going to use that information on this side of the CRP5. Hopefully you can see that. If I hold it up, you can kind of still make it out, okay. So the airspeed window is where we're starting. So we've got a pressure altitude of 8,000 feet. So we're going to go all the way down to that's 10,000 feet, 5, 6, 7, 8,000 feet. So I've got the zero aligned with the value for 8,000 in terms of temperature. Hopefully you can make that out. And then we're going to spin that to the temperature, which is 9 degrees. So positive is this this side. So that's 5 degrees, 9 degrees, just there. And then we've got a calibrated airspeed of 145. So calibrated airspeed is on the inner scale. You can see the CAS there. We're going around to 145, which is conveniently located up at the top. And the true airspeed is on the outside. You can see that there. So we're reading that off the outside scale. And that looks to me as if it is 163 knots. 163 is definitely the closest. So we'll go for 163 as our true airspeed. True airspeed equals 163. Okay, so we've got a true airspeed, we've got a wind velocity, we've got a track. Um, we're going to find out the ground speed. So, get round onto the other side, pull rubber, and if we can, we put in the wind first. So it's 163, and the value is 15. 163 at 15. One six three, sorry, one six three, and the value fifteen knots is about there. And then we're going to slide up to the true airspeed, which we said was one six three knots. One six two three. One six three. And then we're going to spin to the heading which we don't have actually so we'll put up the track at the top and then make some adjustments from there so when we've got the track at the top of 343 three, four, one, two, three. then we have to look at our picture and if we say that we've got the if we think of the 343 as now being a heading we have to check that if there's any drift and if the drift makes it 343 in terms of track, then we're on the correct heading. So if this is now a heading of 343, because remember that triangle, if you've watched the video on how to use a CRP5, I explain it in terms of a triangle, you've got one side which has the true airspeed matched with the heading. So when we've got the true airspeed up here, we have to have the heading at the top. And if it all matches, um, and there's no drift like is the case now very handily then we don't have to change anything but if it doesn't match we've got to adjust until it makes sense uh, watch the video if you haven't because this, that explanation wasn't very good <laughs> anyway 343 three. we have no drift so it's good it means we're on the correct heading and it's giving us the correct track of 343 three. that means that our ground speed is going to be was that 178 knots but 178 doesn't appear to be an option so 163 at 15 I did that then I slid it up to 163 what are we closest to we're closest to 181 is that me just being rubbish at drawing 
Should we go for 181? Yeah, it's me just being rubbish at drawing. And me not um, getting it accurate enough on the previous side. Lines on the Earth's surface that join points of equal magnetic variation are called. Ooh, this is something I completely forgot about. Um, so, ISO means the same, right? So, isogrives probably means isogravity. Isoclines, like the, the, the compass in declining. Isogonals, isotachs, oof, isoclines, nah, isogonals, there you go, completely forgot about that, um, another CRP5 looking one, you can just tell sometimes when it says given, you're like alright, CRP5 time. Heading 307, tras this, track this, calculate the wind velocity, so we're doing it, the process in reverse, basically. So we're going to the true airspeed at 230 knots. 230 up here. Where are you? There. 230 is there. Um, heading is 307. 205, 306, 307. Gives us a ground speed of 210. So we're down here. And the track is 313. 313 compared to 307 is 6 degrees further to the right. So that means 6 degrees of drift. So we're over here and it's 210 knots. So it's this point in here. 210 on the ground speed, 6 degrees of drift to the right would give us 313. And then we go back down to the wind velocity card at the bottom. It's hard to adjust mine. And then we spin around until it lines up. Two, six, one at 30 knots. 260 at 30. Close. Cool. Um, parallels of latitude on a direct Mercator chart are parallels of latitude direct Mercator charts. So they start off very close together and then they sort of spread out to go apart. Straight lines converging above the pole. How can they be straight and converge? Arcs of concentric circles equally spaced. That would be um, Lambert's charts. Parallel straight lines equally spaced at the beginning, yes, parallel light. Parallel straight lines unequally spaced. Well, they're unequal because they start to spread. Yeah, there we go. An arc follows a radial to, to a VUR DME station. At 10 o'clock, the DME reads 120. At 10.03, it reads 105. The estimated time overhead to VUR DME station is X. Speed distance time. Okay, so to cover 120 to 105 is 50 knock miles so 50 knock miles takes how long three minutes so we can work out our speed v equals 15 over the time of 0 0.3 so that's um i'll just do it with the calculator instead of working out it's so much easier it's more useful probably so 15 divided by zero hours and three minutes is 300 hours. Mm, that can't be right. Speed. Oh, right. No, yeah, not 300 hours. That's just like a value of 300. So the speed is 300 knots. That makes more sense. Um, the estimated time over the VOR DME station is, so we've got 105 nautical miles left to run. Um, so distance, uh, 300 knots, sorry, equals the distance 105 divided by the time, time equals 105 divided by 300, 105 divided by 300, 
uh, 0.35 hours 0.35 hours and if you multiply that by 60 you get the answer in minutes 21 minutes so 10.03 plus 21 minutes 10.24 Cool. Um, what's next? So, an aircraft flies from point A at north 50 to point B also at north 50. Um, what is the approximate ground distance covered? So we're doing departure. That's what this is. If we're both on the same um, latitude, then we can do departures. Point A north 50, west 8. So point A is over here, and that's... Uh, Zero zero eight degrees thirty minutes west. Point B is way more west, all the way over here, one thirty four degrees thirty six minutes. And so we work, work out the change in longitude here, and then plug it into our departure equation, which is the change in longitude times sixty, and then we multiply that by the cosine of the latitude. So change of longitude for this one, uh, 134 degrees and 36 minutes take off 8 degrees and 30 minutes, 126 degrees and 6 minutes times that by 60 times that by the cosine of latitude, cosine latitude is cosine 50, 126.6 times 60 times cosine 50 equals um, 4863 4863 and then is there anything that's even close to that? 4863 hmm have I done these the wrong way around? 134 134 degrees 36 minutes. Take away 8 degrees and 30 minutes. 126.6 or 126.1 that is times 60 times by cosine 50. 4863. So there's 4683. Have they just written the outs? Have I just done something wrong? What's happened? Four, six, eight, three, what? Approximate ground distance it has covered. Oh my days. Bloody nautical miles and kilometers. That is sneaky. Ah, that's, that's annoying me that is. So my answer of 4863, okay, let's work out that one in kilometers. So kilometers is 1.8, so there's 1.852 kilometers in every nautical mile. So if we then um, multiply the answer by 1.852, is it going to give us 9006 kilometers? Oh my god, the bloody answers were in different units. Okay, okay, it is what it is. <sighs> Bastards. <laughs> uh, an aircraft is departing from an airport which has an elevation of 2000, the QNH is 1023, the TAS is 100, the headwind component is 20 knots, the rate climb is 1000, top climb is so what the distance from the airport will this be achieved. So, learn from my previous mistake that I'm going to change the elevation of 2000 into a pressure altitude. So, 2,000 feet above the Q&H, which is 1023. 1013 is up here, and this distance in here will do 30 this time. 30 times 10 equals 300 feet. So the actual pressure altitude of the aerodrome 
above 1013 is 1,700 feet. We're climbing up to flight level 100, which is 10,000 feet, a pressure altitude of 10,000 feet. So the distance in terms of altitude change is going to be 10,000 minus 1,700, so that's 8,300 feet to change. And then we're doing that equation again. So the ground distance over the ground speed multiplied by 60 equals time, which also equals the vertical change over the vertical speed. And we'll work out this bit first and then come back and do this. So the time equals the vertical change, 8,300 over 1,000. So the time equals 8.3 and then we use that over here ground distance over the ground speed ground speed true air speed of 100 and the headwind component of 20 so it's 80 knots again and uh, multiply by 60 equals 8.3 the time sorry i don't understand oh my god <laughs> My uh, Google just went mental. I'll turn my phone off properly. Anyway, apologies. Um, where were we? So 8.3 divided by 60, then multiplied by 80 gives us our ground distance. 8.3 over 60 and times that by 80. Ground distance equals 8.3 times 80 equals divided by 60, 11 nautical miles, 11.1. Cool. Where is the international date line located? To the east of the 18 meridian only, exactly on the 180 meridian, in the vicinity of the 180 meridian to the west of the 180. So it's in the vicinity because it doesn't line up exactly. There's a few kinks and stuff. So it's in the vicinity, C. The definition of true north for any observer is the reading of the observer's compass corrected for deviation and local variation. CDMVDT, Cadbury's Dairy Milk, very tasty. So compass, corrected for deviation, corrected for variation, A is okay. Director, direction of the observer's magnetic north, corrected for local variation. Direction of the Greenwich Meridian to the North Pole, direction of the observer's meridian to the North Pole. So I think it's D, because that's the one that doesn't vary at all. Reading of the observers, so you get like some error, the compass could be duff, and then that doesn't work. Direction of the observer is magnetic north, again, that could be, um, yeah, dependent on where you are and stuff like that. So I'm gonna say D. So yeah, you follow the line of meridian up and they all converge at the top of the North Pole the true North Pole. 24, the charted values of magnetic variation on Earth normally changes annually due to a reducing field strength causing numerical values at all locations to decrease. That's wild. Numbers can go up as well as down. An increasing field strength causing numericals to increase. Yeah, that's wild. Magnetic pole movement causing numerical values at all locations to increase magnetic pole movement causing numerical values at all locations to increase or decrease. So the molten core of the Earth um, is moving around all the time. So the magnetic pole moves and it can cause numbers to either decrease or increase, D. 25, the Q and H given by a station at 2,500 feet is 980. The elevation of the highest obstacle along the route is 8,000 temperatures this uh, in minus 10, when an aircraft en route has to descend the minimum indicated altitude, the Q 
QNH on the subscale of the altimeter to maintain a clearance of 2,000 feet will be, okay, drawing the picture. So we've got temperature corrections to deal with this time. So that's, we apply temperature corrections to the indicated altitude to find out the true altitude. So our indicated altitude to start off with is what we're looking for. <laughs> so the QNH is 2,500 feet. Uh, QNH isn't that. QNH is 980, 980 hectopascals, and that gives us an altitude of 2,500 feet. The elevation of the highest obstacle along the route is 8,000 feet, so that'll be based off of the same thing because it's um, elevation. That's also going to be off 980 hectopascals. Okay. The outside air temperature is ice at minus 10. So that's where our temperature correction comes in. Four degrees, four feet, sorry, per thousand feet of height per degree ISA deviation. When an aircraft route has its center, minimum medical algae to maintain a clearance of 2,000 feet. So it needs to descend to 10,000 feet indicated, because that's 2,000 above the 8,000 obstacle, on the QNH of 980 hectopascals. Okay, so we need to work out the true altitude. It's gonna be higher than this because we're colder. So the, maintain a clearance of 2,000 feet. So just by my rough thinking, I think it's gonna be this one, but we'll do it properly. So ISA deviation is four feet per thousand feet of height. So thousand feet of height between 10,000 feet, because that would maintain the 2,000 feet change, would be 7,500, 7.5 per one degree of ICA deviation minus 10. That needs to be multiplies. Four by seven point five by ten is three hundred. So that means that we're going to be three hundred feet lower than expected. So when we're actually at ten thousand feet, we're going to be at nine thousand seven hundred feet indicated. So we need to be three hundred feet higher. If that makes sense. So when the temperature is at minus 10, our true altitude is going to be 9,700 feet. So we need to be above by 300 feet at least. So 10,400. All the layers become squished together in the cold. So we've got to go above where we think. An aircraft, sorry, an island appears 30 degrees to the left of the aircraft's longitudinal axis. What is the true bearing of the aircraft from the island if at the time of observation the aircraft is on a magnetic heading of 0 to 0 with a magnetic variation of 25 degrees west? Okay, so draw it out. Um, 30 degrees, true bearing of the aircraft from the island. Okay. Uh, we're, aircraft was on a magnetic heading of 0 to 0. So we were up here, flying along, magnetic heading, zero to zero degrees. We spot an island, which has a relative bearing of 30 degrees to the left. So that's gonna be 30 degrees back this way. Um, magnetic variation is 25 degrees west. So the magnetic bearing, should we convert it to true first? That's maybe the way to do it. So magnetic north, true north. Maybe this, what's the best way to do this? Calculate the angle to the island. Apply the variation there. Yeah, okay, so relative to magnetic north, 
we start off and we're zero to zero, 30 degrees would be 10 degrees further back. So from the aircraft to the island, this angle in here is 350 degrees magnetic. Okay, and then we can apply the variation. So Cadbury's Dairy Milk, milk very tasty. 350, 25 degrees west is negative variation to give true. And that's gonna us our true direction to the island from the aircraft, and then we have to invert it. So that's three to five degrees true aircraft to island and we're wanting from the aircraft from the island so we're going to um, take the reciprocal of this 180 degrees we can plus two minus two or minus two plus two so minus two is one two five and then plus two on the second so one four five degrees true c Five hours, 20 minutes, and 20 seconds corresponds to a longitude difference of, okay, arc to time, basically. So we can say that for every um, 15 degrees that we change, it's one hour, okay? And every degree that we change drops down to four minutes. So we are five hours, so five times the 15 for a start, five times 15, 75, 75 degrees of uh, longitude to start with. 20 minutes is going to be 20 divided by four. It's five, isn't it? So five um, minutes. No, that's, sorry, then we add those degrees on, Never mind. So 75 degrees in terms of the hours and then 20 minutes of time equals five degrees of longitude, so that would be 80 total. And the 20 seconds, well, if you think about a degree is four minutes, that would mean that one minute of time, it's confusing when you're talking about longitude and time and stuff like that, because there's minutes and degrees and seconds and stuff like that, both. But bear with me, so one degree longitude change equals four minutes. So therefore, one minute of longitude change equals 0 0.25. No, one minute of time is 0 0.25 degrees. And then 20 seconds, we divide that by a further three and you get 0 0.083, which is probably unnecessary because it's gonna be 0 0.05, yes. Confusing. A ground feature appears 30 degrees to the left of the central line of the CRT of an airborne weather radar. If the heading of the aircraft is 355 and the magnitude variation East, the true bearing of the aircraft class. This is similar to what we just did. Get a new page. Um, a ground feature appears 30 degrees to the left centre line of the CRT of an airborne weather radar. What's the CRT? Just like the cathode ray tube? Like the TV screen? If the heading of the aircraft is 355, the neck variation to 15, the true bearing of the aircraft. So, um, 355 up here. To three five five degrees, and that's from the weather station um, to the ground. Ground feature appears thirty degrees to the left of this. Oh, that was just our heading. Never mind. So thirty degrees to the left of this is five two five five two three two five even. Three to five degrees magnetic weather station to ground. Magnetic variation fifteen degrees east. Cabbage dairy milk very tasty. Three to five variation east is positive, so plus fifteen equals true. That's uh, three forty degrees true. 
weather station to ground, weather station to ground, the true bearing of the aircraft from the feature. So again, we're doing reciprocals, minus two, plus two, one, six, zero degrees true. B. The airport chart for Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada, shows the variations at 18 degrees west. The final approach track for the ILS to the runway 23 is given as 233 degrees. The drift on final approach is 6 degrees right. What is the true direction of the final approach track? The true direction of the final approach track. The drift on final approach is 6 degrees right. Okay, why is it giving us that drift information? Drift information is a bit of a um, trick there, I think, because it's not asking for heading. So drift is kind of unimportant for us. Um, so runway 23, runways are always given as magnetic because it's a ILS is, I don't think I actually covered that in my navigates, but that's more um, specific. It's like a VOR that's very sensitive um, and works on runways, basically, if you've not heard of them before, instrument landing system. And because it's a radio beacon, it gives off magnetic signals. So this is a very simple cabbage dairy milk, very tasty variation and deviation sort of stuff. So magnetic variation, true. The variation is 18 degrees west, that's negative. And the ILS for runway 23 is 233. 233 degrees minus 18 equals true. Oof. Quick maths 233 minus 18, 215 is the true. D. C says in big writing, underlined the drift is not relevant in this question. There you go. Um, somebody's asking, uh, apologies, I keep on checking the YouTube uh, like comments every so often just to see. Um, Yogi, will you keep this video up? Yeah, that's the kind of the idea of these videos. I'm just gonna keep them up and you can watch them whenever you want. I don't expect many people to actually watch them and um, you know, do it with me as we're doing it. But yeah, just watch them in the future. That's uh, kind of the point in them. Go back to what I'm actually doing. What is the difference in longitude from Oslo to Sacramento? Difference in longitude from Longo, from Oslo to Sacramento? That's a very nice question. We're going east to west. Okay, so we're going from the east crossing over the prime meridian into the west so we're adding the longitudes together and we're just going to do it with the calculator using the degrees minute seconds function so 10 degrees east and 47 minutes east in oslo and then we're adding on 121 and 24 to get to uh, sacramento for a difference of one three two one one. A. Yeah. What a great little question. Fuel, 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 fuel. VOR is located at seventy six degrees thirty two north, sixty eight degrees fifteen west. On a post area, we have a chart with the grid aligned with the Greenwich meridian is used. The local variation is 75 degrees west, which grid track must be maintained to track radial 210 magnetic inbound. Okay, so pull the graphic chart. Looks very not like that, but it looks something like that. We have the zero meridian here and that's where our grid is aligned. So grid north is always gonna be pointing up towards the top of the page. Fuel VOR is located at 76 north, um, 68 degrees, 15 minutes west. So it's to the west by like 60 degrees, it's gonna be right here. And that means that this angle in here, 
68 degrees 50 minutes west 50 minutes is 0.25 of an hour so I'm going to call that 68.25 degrees this angle in here 68.25 the local variation is 75 degrees west which grid track must be maintained to track radial 210 inbound so Grid track, ba -da -ba -ba -ba. grid track must be maintained to track a radial of 210 inbound. So radial 210 is going to be up here somewhere. Track radial 210 inbound, so we're tracking up here. Is that what we're looking for? Grid tracks. Quite a confusing question, actually. The local variation of grid track must be maintained to keep the track inbound. So that's true right in there. So what I'm going to do is we've really got to. I'm feeling like we're going to have to use cabbage dairy milk very tasty GCG in this case because we've got grid convergence. Two ten magnetic inbound. And then we just convert that. Yeah, I'm, I'm overcomplicating things. So Cabri's dairy milk, very tasty. And then we've got the additional grid convergence equals grid on the end. So we've got a magnetic heading, magnetic radial. Grid track must be maintained to track radial 210 inbound. So 210, tracking radial 210 inbound, we actually need to track the other way. Is that right? So 210 radial, we want to track that inbound, which means a 130, no, 210 to, um, would be 030 in terms of track, to actually track it inbound. So I'm gonna go for 030 as the starting point, and that's not magnetic. So 210 radials, like down here somewhere, and if we want to track this one inbound, we're going to have to steer 0, 3, 0 to go in. That's my logic, that's what I'm trying to figure out just now. So 30 degrees magnetic, variation is 75 degrees west, minus 75 equals the true. 30 minus 75, um, we're not going to go into negative numbers, are we? We're going to go to 45 degrees and the other way, so 45, 360 minus 45 is 315. We've gone back around by 75, so we're on 315 degrees is the true direction. Grid convergency, the true north is to the east of grid north. So it's easterly grid convergence. So in this case, we've got 315 plus the easterly grid convergence of 68.25 to give us our grid direction. Grid direction, 315 plus 68, let's call it 383, which doesn't make any sense because it's more than 360, 23, I'm gonna go for option D. Yes. Right, let's see what it's drawn as a picture. Hopefully show you guys this. So yeah, roughly what I drew. So I drew the prime meridian, we're at 68 degrees more or less. Off to the side. We're tracking the 210 radial inbound of, yeah, coming in like this. So we're starting off and then applying the convergency, uh, the variation and grid convergency to this coming in. Yeah, okay, cool. Takes a while to get your head around it sometimes. 32. 32 from 55, Whew, still got a few to go. Um, an aircraft departs from position A and flies northward following the meridian for 2950, then flies westward, parallel latitude for 382 to position B, what are the coordinates of position B? 
Okay, so this is going to be, if we're looking at distances, um, departure, basically when we're flying along parallels of latitude. But initially, we're going north, following meridian for 2950 nautical miles. So 2950 nautical miles. If you're following a meridian, the lines, um, each degree is 60 nautical miles. So we can say that 2950 divided by 60, we're going to change in latitude by 49 degrees and 10 minutes. We're in the south hemisphere to start off with and we're flying north. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the value that we have for our um, position A. So that's 4 degrees and 10. I'll take that from our answer and get to 45 because we've covered 410 and then we're covering another 45 to get up to this. So our um, final longitude of position B, sorry, final latitude is 45 degrees north. Cool. Um, B and C both have B and C both have 45 degrees north. And then we're working out the departure. So departure equals the change in long longitude multiplied by 60 times the cosine of the latitude. We've got 60, we've got cosine of latitude because it's 45. We don't have the change in longitude, but we do have the departure, which is 382. And then we'll just rearrange this. So 382 divided by 60 times 45 equals the change in longitude. And 382 divided by 60 times 45, 0 0.14. That doesn't seem like very far at all. 0 0.14. Eight minutes. Is that possible? I suppose it is. Yeah, they're all quite close. Okay, so. Um, 8 minutes 30 seconds, so it's 8.5 minutes we've flown. Um, and it flies westward. So it's going from 178 degrees west, ah, I knew it would do something like this, and 22 minutes. And we're only flying for 8 minutes more, okay, so we're going to go to 178.30. Is that making sense? No, it was 0.14. What have I done here? Oh, I just did 45, I didn't do cosine 45. Okay, so I forgot to take the cosine 45 here. That's why my answer is all weird. So that's good that we spotted that. Um, cosine 45 gives us a value for this, multiply that by 60 to get a value for this, then we'll divide 382 by this number, 9, 9 degrees change in longitude to the west. So we're going to fly over the 180 meridian and we're going to fly over it by um, about seven or so, seven and a half minute. Well, I can tell it's gonna be this one because we're gonna fly over to the east. Given the following information, what are the distances from A to B and from A to C respectively? Position A is this, position C is this. North 60, north 60, then north 59. So north 60 to north 60, so it's just departure. Again, because it's asking for distances. Um, let me just check. Um, sorry, I'm just reading some comments now. GG's, John Paulson, thank you very much. Um, 
Tylox's high of question. Is the HBO question bank are good for the 2020 syllabus? I think so. I'm not sure what syllabus I'm doing. I just clicked on question banks and this one came up and I searched for it. So um, I wasn't, yeah, I think they'll be all right. Some of them will be updated. I'm sure some of them won't be, but um, yeah, should be okay. Anyway, back to the actual meat. Given the following information, what are the distance from A to B departure? Okay, so departure equals change in longitude, north 60, west 20 to west 21, that's one degree change, times 60, times the cosine of latitude, cosine 60, is half, just know that from being sound. Um, so 60 times half, departure is 30, so it's 30 knot miles for the first one. And from from then to A to C. So A to C departure equals A north 60, west 20 to west 20, but it's further south, it's gonna be six. So we're just flying straight along a meridian. So it's uh, 60, yeah, C, double check. At 1400 UCC an aircraft, 550 knock miles from point B is requested to reach point B at 1525 UTC. Um, present cruise conditions um, are flight level 290 is temperature minus 44 degrees when component minus 70 what is the required Mach number to comply with the specified time speed distance time but more complicated um, pretty much um, so 1400 UTC what am I doing here let's just think about this for a second Miles point B is right to be at 15, so we're working speed distance time. We could work out our required ground speed to do that, and then work out backwards from that. Yeah, so we're working out our speed distance time, and then we'll use that ground speed to calculate a true air speed, then use that true air speed to calculate a Mach number. V equals D over T, speed distance time. V equals distance, 550. Over time, I want that in hours if possible, 15, yes, that's one hour and 25 minutes. Let's do this in the calculator. 550 divided by one hour and 25 minutes. Three, eight, eight. V equals 388 knots. And that's our ground speed. Wing component is minus 70, so our true airspeed is 70 faster than that. True airspeed equals this plus 70. True airspeed is 458 knots. Um, present cruise conditions at Flight level 290 or minus 44 was required Mach number to comply with the specified time. Okay, so we've got a true airspeed from our ground speed. We've got a CRP5 with a Mach um, indicator somewhere here, Mach index. Where's it? You can see that just there. Um, Outside air temperature is minus 44, so that's minus 44 degrees, just below that. Our true air speed, 458. I calculated it as 45. Uh, it's going to be 458 there. So it looks like on the Mach number, which would be on the inner scale. It's about a Mach of 0.81, but that's not there. Hmm. Minus 44 degrees on the Mach number index. One component is minus 70. That's a 
It's an hour twenty five, yeah. Zero point eight five is the closest. But it feels like that's too far away. True airspeed. Ah, okay. I forgot to do the compressibility stuff. So when we're above 300 knots, we have to do compressibility errors. So we are above 300 knots, 458 knots. Compressibility effects we do in this window, but bah, I've not even done that. Minus 44. 4, 5, 8 knots. 4, 5, 8. Looks like it's 8 point something. 0 0.8 something. Um, let's go 0 0.85. No, 0 0.77. Ground speed equals, right, I'll show you the screen here. See what I did wrong. Allocate time 1 hour 25. Required ground speed 388 knots. That's what we got. Required TAS is 458 knots, yes. Align minus 44 with the arrow and the MAC index window. That's what I did. Where are we? MAC index minus 44. TAS 458 on the inner. 45. Eight on the average scale under zero point seven five five. What? What have I done wrong there then? Hmm. Not sure. Anyway. At. 10 o'clock, your position on the 310 radial at 40 nautical miles uh, is on the 310 at 40 nautical miles from a VOR. At 10.15, your position from the same VOR is on the 040 radial, also at 40 nautical miles. What has been your magnetic track and ground speed? Okay, so your position on the 310 radial to start with. 310 is going to be out here somewhere. That's three one zero degrees. Um, at ten fifteen, your position is on the zero four zero, so it's over here, zero four zero degrees, and it's also at forty knock miles. Forty knock miles. Forty knock miles. Same distance. That's what those little equal things mean. Um. What would be your magnetic track and ground speed? So what we can do here is this is going to be an equilateral triangle. So if we work out this angle in here, we'll be able to work out these angles. <laughs> and yeah, we should be able to work backwards from there. Is that right? Yeah, so 310 to 360 is 50 degrees, then to 40 is 50 plus 40, that's 90 degrees. And then these other angles in here will be 45 each. So, what am I doing then? <laughs> oh, then I can work out this angle in here and then work out this angle. Right, okay, so we know that this angle in here, I'll draw this a bit bigger actually, so I've done the smaller triangle, now I've got this one in here. I've calculated that this is 45 because these are equal sides up here. This angle in here is 40 degrees, so we're working out this angle in here to calculate this angle here, which will be our magnetic uh, track that we've been following. So all angles in a triangle are 180, minus the 45 and minus the 40, so minus 95 equals a, is that nice? No, minus 85, so 95 degrees is this angle in here. And 180 minus 95 to find out the angle here, 
again that's back to 85 is our magnetic track cool and the ground speed so we need to now work out the distance between this point and this point how are we going to do that so we've got 40 degrees here this angle in here works out and it's 90 degrees we can do um, Pythagoras theory even can't we yeah so a b c a squared plus b squared equals c squared um, 40 squared plus 40 squared equals c squared god I love it when school knowledge comes in so 40 squared plus 40 squared equals this and then we square root that to find out the distance. So it's 56.6 nautical miles equals the distance. And our time is 10 to 10, 15, 0 0.25 hours. Speed equals distance over time. Speed equals 56.6 over 0 0.25 because it's 0 0.25 hours. Two two six knots and eighty five degrees magnetic. Please tell me there's one that looks like that. Zero eight five and two two six. Nice. Their picture might make it a bit more clear because mine was a bit cramped and small. Um, but yeah, it's, that's what I was doing. But I didn't do it on this side. I did it in the middle here. Worked it out. That, that was yeah yeah came to the same answer didn't we uh, refer to image which aeronautical symbol indicates a flight information region boundary oh right so one three five four one three five four or one I'm pretty sure it's one. Yeah, that's just something that you look at some charts. Um, that I don't know how I knew that, but that's just from looking at charts all day. It's kind of seeped in. Um, there you go. Right before I do this, let's have a check at the. Uh, if anybody's said anything. And. Um, BX7, are you an airline pilot? I am, yes. I um, work for a company in the UK. Was working yesterday, actually. Went down to Fuerteventura and back, um, which took a few hours. It's down in the Canary Islands. Um, go back. I should really figure out a better way to do this. Third screen. Cool, so given true air speed 225, heading is 135, wind velocity is that. Calculate the track and the ground speed. So given, whenever I see given, I think of CRP5. Look at this rubber, this is very cool, this thing. Um, if we've got wind, we do that first. So get our wind card, slide that in, are we on the Slow speed side, true air speed is 225, yeah, so we'll be fine on this side. Make sure it's the right way up. Wind value of 090 at 60. Oof, maybe I'm not gonna be okay, so all right. Oh no, <laughs> 090 at 60. 090 is the direction, direction first, Grant. You should know that. 090 at 60 knots. X marks the spot. See that there? Slide up to the true speed, 225 knots. 225 knots there. Um, and our heading was 123. 123, just there. 
Um, calculate the track and the ground speed. So the track is a 10 degree drift to the right, so that's 1, 2, 3, that makes 1, 3, 3. Um, and the ground speed is 1, 7, 8. 1, 3, 3, 7, 8. 1, 3, 4, 7, 8. Close enough. Which option describes the greatest potential threat for VFR navigation at night? Um, I'm thinking terrain, but um, it's difficult to determine the flight direction of other aircraft unless their landing lights are on. Not true, you can tell by the lights. So the uh, left hand side has a right, eh, left hand side has a red light and the right hand side of the aircraft is a green light. So if you see a red light um, on the left, you know that you're flying behind them. But if you see the red light on the right, then you know that they're flying towards you, if that makes sense. Exposure to red light can cause the eyes to lose dark adaptation and may cause temporary blindness. Mm, potential threat, red light. Um, yeah, the aircraft height during an approach can be easily misjudged due to insufficient visual cues. So altitude can be difficult, yeah. When external lighting provides good visual cues, flying by cross-reference to inference may cause spatial disorientation. So I'm gonna say C. External visual cues can be lead to misjudgment of height. Oh, another um, symbols one. Um, I'll get rid of this so you can see them. There we go. So refer to annex here. Which aeronautical chart symbol indicates an exceptionally high lighted obstacle? It's exceptionally high. 12, 10, 13, 14. 12, 10, 13, 14. Which one of these looks exceptionally high with light? 14. Exceptionally high light obstacle? 14. Yep. What is the distance? What is the Earth distance of one degree of longitude at latitude sixty degrees south? So this is a very simple sort of departure style question, but it's just asking for one degree. So like we just did here actually. So the departure of one degree, so one times sixty is sixty times the cosine of 60. No, it's actually exactly the one that we just did here. 30. That's handy. Cool. On a Mercator chart, a distance of 6.2 centimeter equals 248 nautical miles on the equator. At a latitude of 42 degrees north, 6.2 centimeters equals a real distance of so we're going to do ABBA scale stuff. OK, so ABBA. Scale A times cosine B equals scale of B times cosine of A. First things first, we have to work out what the scale is. So 6.2 centimetres equals 248 nautical miles, which equals 248 nautical miles. If I times that by 1852, I get the answer in meters. So it's this many meters. So I'm not going to bother writing it down because I'll probably lose my space. This many meters. If we times it by 100, it's that many centimeters. 6.2 centimeters equals this. And then if we divide by 6.2, we'll find out the value for 1. Divide that by 6.2, and we get 7, 4, 7, 4, 0, 8, 0, 0, 0, 7, 4, 0, 8, 0, 0, 0. And that's the value of, that's the scale, basically. So what we're going to do is then we're going to find out the scale differences and then plug in the value for 6.2. Do we actually have to do that? 6.2 centimetres, we've got a distance, then we've got another distance. So yeah, let's, um, let's not bother dividing by 6.2 actually, let's go back. 
So we've got a real world distance. We can go all the way back to kilometers actually, can't we? Because then we've got 6.2 equals this and then we're measuring exactly the same uh, different point. Okay, let's go back, let's try this thing again. So 248 times, we're looking for the answer in kilometers, 1.852. 1852 is meters, so 1.852 is kilometers. So 6.2 centimeters equals 459.3 kilometers. Okay, that is at the equator. And then we can just substitute in distance instead of scale. So we know that 459.3 three kilometers times the cosine of B, which is going to be 42, equals the distance at B times the cosine of the equator in this case, which is zero. So the cosine of zero is just one. So we kind of don't have to worry about this. So four, five, sorry, four, five, nine point three. That was our value in kilometers. That's six point two centimeters equals. We multiply that by cosine forty two, and that gives us three four one point three, three four one point three um, kilometers distance. Three four one point three. A wind correction angle. All three answers below are correct. Well, I better read them first. Um, will arise whenever the drift is changing during a flight along a fixed track. Is the angle in distance between the desired track and the track made good? A wind correction will be established whenever a crosswind is experienced and the desired track is kept. So you get drift and if you, you get your track, the wind blows you off and you drift by a certain amount. If you mean, if you steer in to the wind, you apply a correction angle, a wind correction angle, and that gives you a heading that maintains the same track. So we'll be established whenever a crosswind experience and the desired track is kept. You're correcting the wind, wind correction angle, correcting for the wind. You're descending to flight level 180, the wind is as follows. For flight planning purposes, select the most appropriate wind to use. Okay, so when you're descending and you want to use the wind to take the average wind when you're descending, um, you take it halfway. In the climb, you take it two thirds because the engine performance starts to degrade when you climb into thinner air. But if we're halfway, um, in the descent, we're not really using the engines that much, so we take that wind. So we're basically looking for the very middle wind in this case. Are we going to interpolate between the two as well? 180250290. So 310 to uh, 180 is going to be, well, if I add them together and take half, that's going to be halfway down. So 310 plus 180 divided by 2, 245 is going to be the best height, uh, best flight level, because that's halfway down. And then 250 to 290, it's going to be, oh, what's happened here? Oh no, my camera's just disconnected for some reason. Not working anymore. Ugh, that's frustrating. Very frustrating. It's not getting battery. That's what's happened. How can I power you up then? What's a better solution? Ah, oh, that's really frustrating. Um, here we go. Okay, we're not got that many left to do, to be honest. I wonder if I could just do it without the camera. Probably not, but we shall try. Here's an actual solution. 
There's always a solution to a problem. This is quite funny, actually. Um, okay, what we're going to do, bear with me, is we're just going to relocate the webcam. Can I do that? Hmm. Okay, we'll try to do it without the camera. I don't know why that's happened. That's quite annoying. Probably because I've been streaming for ages, but oh well. Um, what we can do... Can I move the webcam from there? That would be good. Hmm, maybe not. Okay, we're just going to have to do it without pictures, but that's very annoying. Bloody camera. I was having issues with it before as well, but anyway. So you take the value at halfway, so it's going to be 245 at 40. No, 205 at 40. Oh, I'm getting confused with the levels. I was thinking it was level 245, but it's why I need to interpolate the actual directions. Okay. Um, refer to Jeppesen chart. See, this is very frustrating now because I don't even have a Jeppesen chart. And I would have shown you on another bit of equipment. Um, is this thing going to charge? I thought I didn't need battery. It's got battery now. Okay, bear with. What an absolute joke. I think I might have just overheated. That might be the problem. Apologies to anybody who's watching. Skip ahead. Hopefully you can. No, that's me. Uh, God damn. Where's my mouse gone? seem to want to work. I've got you set up. What about you? You look like you're set up. Yeah, it's closing off again. Okay, I'm just going to have to do this without drawing or explaining what I'm drawing. I'll just explain what I'm drawing along the way. That's uh, very annoying though, very frustrating. Webcam just broke on me. I think it's overheated, but we'll carry on. Refer to Jeppesen GSPRM chart yellow to your bearing of 301 from pole and on a bearing of 001 from WAL VOR 53. What is your position? Okay, I don't even have these charts, but what I'm going to do, I'll describe it to you, is maybe I can just hold up my pictures to the webcam. That's probably the way to do it. Is, uh, <laughs> an absolute joke. Webcam. That's me. Hello. Anyway, so I don't have these charts that they're talking about. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go on my company iPad that I have and get up a chart that will be probably have some of this stuff on it, essentially, and then I'll, I'll hold it up and show you guys. So we're going to where? Pole Hill. Pole Hill? Is that what it is? Pole Hill. Ooh. 
No. It's a VOR DME. Pull. Come on. Why not working? Cool. We're going from Pull Hill. And we're going to WAL. We're not actually going to WAL, but we're interested in it. So let's uh, get rid of some of this noise. So that's what we've got there. Ooh, where are you? Pull Hill to Wallasey, those are the two points that are be somewhere on your charts and we're trying to figure out if we're on a bearing of 001 from WAL, WAL, and uh, 301, so we're looking for where they cross over basically. What is your position? Oof, okay, so this is gonna be just me very roughly estimating 54, I would say maybe 54.5, something like that, 54. Ugh, stop it. Guess. Nah. Draw it down on your chart, that's the way to do it. Um, anyway. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll draw and hold up, that's probably the only way to do it from now on. Apologies, people. Um, here we go. Anyway, what are we saying? Given the following information, what is the crosswind component when landing on a runway 23 degrees, uh, centerline direction 227, ATIS reported wind velocity 180, 30 degrees, 180 degrees, 30 knots, variation 15 degrees east. So ATIS gives information in magnetic, you shouldn't really know that by now but you shouldn't know that but it does and um, so we're basically going to um, we can just do it on the CRP5 so we've got a wind velocity 180 at 30 knots 180 I've put that in my CRP5 drawn 30 knots on it at the bottom like I've been doing up until now. Runway centerline direction is 227 so I spin the CRP5 round to 227 and I'm reading a crosswind of 20 knots. Where are we? So I've got it set at 227 I put in the wind first that looking like a reading of 20 knots to the right. 22 knots, ah, maybe yeah, 22 knots. It's all going to shit since I've lost the camera. Ah, that's very frustrating. Um, which statement about meridians is correct? A meridian and its anti-meridian form a complete great circle. All meridians are parallel to the Greenwich meridian. The plane of a meridian is parallel to the equator. A meridian is a complete great circle. So a meridian is just half. So a meridian and an anti-meridian form a complete great circle. Given the following information, calculate the maximum allowable wind speed, maximum allow crosswind component of 20 knots, runway center line 063 and wind direction of 100. So this is something I actually wanted to show because I didn't really explain it in my CRP5 video, but I should be able to explain it okay. So what you can do is you put on you put the wind direction in. So on the CRP5, you go down to the bottom and you would put, in this case, 100 up at the top. And then you draw a straight line all the way down the uh, line, the wind line, down to wherever you like to stop. So just a straight line as you can. So you'll end up with something that looks like that. It's just a straight line going down the bottom. 
and then you spin it to wherever the wrong run, way centre line direction is. So 063. 063 is there. And then you cross off the maximum crosswind component. So 20 knots, I'm going to make a cross at the 20 knots. Like so, 20 knots. And then I'll spin it back round to the bottom and find out the maximum strength. So spin it back round to 100. And then you would see where it crosses off like that. So that's looking to me like it's 14. Oh no, it's slid up. That's not looking like 14, it's looking like 33, option C. In general terms, what relationship is there between air distance and ground distance between two positions on the ground while cruising at flight level 400 in zero wind conditions? The ground distance is slightly greater than the air distance. The air distance is much greater than the ground distance. The air distance is slightly greater than the ground distance. The air distance is equal to the ground distance between two positions on the ground in zero wind conditions. So if there's no wind, then we're going to travel exactly the same distance. Yeah. A visual checkpoint is a distinct point which is easily visually identifiable on the terrain as well as on the chart, probably, is a reference point which may not be used when proceeding on an instrument flight plan. Is a landmark or feature visible to both the radar and the naked eye? Mm, visual checkpoint, radar, it's not really going hand in hand. Um, that's radio nav stuff. And D is a point used to establish the horizontal visibility or the runway visual range. No, so a visual checkpoint got to be easily visible on the train as well as on visual charts. An aircraft is departing from an airport which has an elevation of 2,000 feet, the QNH is 1003. The TAS is 100 knots, the headwind component is 20 knots, and the rate of climb is 1,000. Did I not do this one already? I feel like I did this one already. Maybe it was slightly different. Well, I only about 5,000, so. Right, explain what I'm drawing, basically, as I'm going along now. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna draw the elevation of 2,000 feet above a Q&H of 1003. we're going to want to climb to flight level 100. So we're gonna get this elevation into the um, equivalent pressure altitude. Flight level 100's pressure altitude is 10,000 feet. Because you just add a couple of zeros and that's how you get pressure altitude, flight level to pressure altitude. So we want our airport elevation in terms of pressure altitude. So 1003 is the QNH. The, what we base pressure altitudes off is 1013, which will be lower down the page, or the earth as well, I suppose, by 10 hectopascals. 10 hectopascals times by 30 foot per hectopascal is 300 feet. That means our elevation in terms of pressure altitude is 2,300 feet. And that means that we've got to climb 10,000 minus 2,300, which is 7,700 feet to climb. Like that. Then we pop in the equation, the ground distance over the ground speed times 60 equals time. Time also equals the altitude change over the vertical speed. Work out the vertical section first. So the time is equal to the altitude change, which is 7,700 7, feet over the vertical speed, which is 1,000 feet per minute. That is a time of 7.7. .7. Excuse me. 
And then we have the ground distance, is what we're trying to find. Ground speed, true air speed, plus a headwind component of 20 knots, so we're going to be slower, slowing us down. Ground speed of 80, 60, and 7.7. .7. So then we're going to do ground distance equals 7.7 .7 times 80 over 60. It's going to look like this. This is a very frustrating way to do it. And then, sorry, <clears throat> voice is starting to go. We'll do the calculation on my calculator. I'll tell you what the answer is. 7.7 .7 times 80 divided by 60, ground distance of 10.26, 10.3, take a drawing now. Your rate of climb is calculated as 11,000 feet per minute at a true speed of 200 knots. At that airspeed, what minimum headwind component is required to achieve a climb gradient of 6%? Okay, that's quite a cool question. So 6% is the um, gradient, yeah. So a gradient is the um, vertical change over the horizontal change, I got it out eventually, times by 100. So vertical over horizontal times by 100 equals the gradient. So the gradient of 6% is equal to your vertical of um, 11,000 feet per minute. No, 1,100 feet per minute over the horizontal Oh, we're working in feet per minute and nautical miles though, aren't we? Is there not an easy way to do this? Rate of descent equals the percentage times the ground speed. Yeah, cool, so we can do that. That's the quick, quick calculation. The rate of descent or the rate of climb equals the percentage multiplied by the ground speed because it's the quirk of the angles and stuff, cool. So the rate of climb in this case equals the gradient of 6% times by the ground speed 1100 divided by 6 equals the ground speed One eight three point three knots for the ground speed. So that's the equation um, that just happens to be a quirk of the angles. So normally you're working out percentages in terms of or gradients in terms of the vertical change over the horizontal change. But because we're working in uh, feet per minute and not miles per hour, there's the differences in units and the differences in times. You can just do the uh, the rate of climb or the rate of the descent is equal to the gradient in terms of percentage multiplied by the ground speed. So I've done up here in the top corner, the rate of climb equals six times the ground speed. Rate of climb is 1100 feet per minute divided by six equals the ground speed, which is 183.3 knots. And our true air speed is 200 knots. So we have to be going at least 183.3 to achieve this. So we're gonna go uh, hmm, minimum headwind component is going to be 20 knots. Yes, nearest available basically. What will the risk, what will be the risk if a night VFR flight navigates out of the studied route? Um, terrain, or that's kind of what's immediately going into my head. So airports may be difficult to identify due to their lighting. Obstacles may seem to be closer. 
Obstacles marked on the chart in red may not be seen if you're using a red wavelength light or torch. Obstacles may be present in an area not studied before the flight. So if you're flying along somewhere and you know um, there's mountains miles away off to the east of your direction and then suddenly you're far east of where you thought you were, you could be a lot closer to those mountains than you thought you were. D. An aircraft at flight level 390 is required to descend to cross a DME facility at flight level 70. Maximum rate of descent is 2,500 feet per minute. Mean ground speed during the descent is 248 knots. What is the minimum range from the DME at which the descent should commence? So this is another one where we do our ground distance over ground speed times 60 um, equals the time and then we do the time equals the altitude change over the vertical speed. So ground distance times 60 over the ground speed equals time equals alt change or vertical change or you will call it over the vertical speed. So vertical side first because we've got information for that. 390 to 70 is 320 so it's 3 Two zero 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 feet, thirty two thousand feet is the change in altitude, and that at a vertical speed of two thousand five hundred feet per minute. So the time is equal to thirty two thousand feet divided by two thousand five hundred feet every minute is twelve point eight mins. That's just the first side of the equation there the vertical aspect, 32,000 feet divided by 2,500 equals 12.8 minutes. We then use that time in the other side of the equation. Ground distance is what we're trying to find out. Multiply by 60 over the ground speed, 248, equals 12.8. And then if we rearrange, we get that 12.8 multiplied by 248. Ooh. Double times 12.8 times 248 divided by 60, and we get a ground distance of 52.9 nautical miles. So we need to start our descent at 52.9 nautical miles, which is option A 53. The TT, the true track, is 215. True airspeed is 90, wind velocity is 290 at 20. The true heading and ground speed are CRP5. It's really the coolest thing. It's like a spinny round rubber, like rotates really fast. So it just like wipes everything out. I'm amazed by it, it's cool. Um, anyway, anyway. Wind first, if we can, 260 at 20, 260 at 20 knots. Two six zero twenty is in, more or less, 260 at 20. Then we go up to true air speed of 90. True air speed of 90 is set. Where is the camera? I keep, can't find it. There we go. Two, then we can spin it to 215 at the top, which is there. Then we can read off the, oh, that's the true track. Okay, so we've got to do a bit of um, maneuvering here. So we've set the true track up at the top, which is 215, but the drift says it's 10 degrees which doesn't make any sense because if our headings at the top of 215 then our actual track would be 205 so we're gonna have to steer into this wind so if I set 220 um, in here so our true heading up at the top of 220 our drift is still about 10 which means that our true track would be 205 which means that that triangle doesn't match. So I'm gonna try to steer a bit more. 205, 
That was looking about nine, so two, one, nine, and a drift of nine. That's looking better. Oh no, I'm looking for two, one, five. Oh yeah, two, no, two, two, four, that's it. So if I'm on a heading of two, two, four, my drift is nine degrees to the left, meaning that my true track is two, one, five, which is what the question is asking for. So two, two, nine, sorry, two, two, four, two, two, four, um, drift of nine. So I'm gonna go for, it's either A or C, and reading the ground speed off here, it's closer to 70, it's 75. Cool, last question. Which of the following statements most accurately describes the appearance of parallels of latitude on a polar stereographic chart? Parallels of latitude appear as straight lines intersecting with meridians at 90? No. Concentric circles around the pole. Curves concave to the equator, curves convex to straight lines on the chart. Concentric circles around the poles. Like this. Okay, so we've got a few wrong there. What did we score? 87.7, still pretty good. Um, what did we get wrong? First one, oh yeah. So on Lambert's charts, we draw them as straight lines, um, but the lines are actually in reality slightly curved towards the parallel of origin. Uh, question 12. Yeah, learn from that mistake. We adjust the airfield elevation into a pressure altitude, not the pressure altitude or flight level into an indicated altitude because you're actually trying to achieve the flight level, not the indicated altitude. Yep, completely forgot this. This is something I just completely forgot to even think about. An isogonal is lines of equal magnetic variation. 20 in aircraft. Oh yeah, this bloody question. Read the, uh, read the answers and that was the perfect example because I think I had something like 4583 and one of the answers was 4853, just the numbers swapped slightly around. So make sure that if you get an answer that's kind of close but not exact, look at the units. Always look at the units because if I converted this into kilometers, that would have been perfectly correct. Um, 34. Um, yeah, my CRP5 just wasn't lining up properly for this. I did everything, I followed through the steps. So one hour 25 got me 388 knots, which I'd written down and it went through all the steps, but still got it wrong. So I'm not really too sure what I did. Um, this one, this was when the camera broke. Can you tell I was stressing? Um, <laughs> you're descending from flight level 180 to what? So I picked the correct altitude which would have been um, 245, which is what it says behind in the explanation. It says, yeah, the wind velocities for altitude 245, which is halfway down would be the most appropriate. So you have to interpolate between these two is basically what it's saying. Um, taking the average of values and finding the one that's closest. 44, you've got to have a Jepson to be able to do this properly. I don't have them anymore. Um, but what you would do on that is you would find these points, Pole Hill and Wallacey. Wallacey, yeah. And put your, what do you call it, protractor down on it. Line the magnetic north of the protractor with the nearest magnetic north line that you can see and draw on these angles. So, you'd, from the pole hill, you'd find pole hill, you'd put your protractor on, line it up with magnetic north, get 301, and just draw a big old line going up. Then you would find Wallacey, or Wallacey probably, not Wallacey. And uh, again, you would put the protractor on it line that up with the local magnetic north, draw 001, big old line, find the cross position, and then find the coordinates. 
45, given the following information, what is the crosswind component when landing on the runway? Did I not get that right? What did I say? Oh, that's actually, yeah, I've never thought about doing it that way, actually, not using the CRP5, just use the um, trigonometry value. And then the rest we got right. So there we go. You can pass an exam, even if you um, camera breaks and you stress out halfway through. Do loads of practice. Um, apologies for the camera going down. Um, I think it was just because this is quite a long stream and it's probably run out of battery and it hasn't done that in the past ones. Um, so yeah, practice, practice, practice and learn from the mistakes. Go back through your exams like I've just done there and write down what you've got to do, what you've got to study, what your weak points are and yeah, practice, practice, practice on the CRP5 more than anything else because that came up so many um, in so many questions. Um, that's it for GNAV. I'm going to be moving on to meteorology next. Uh, I've started writing scripts for that. I need to start filming and stuff like that. So it might be a couple of weeks yet before the first one goes up. Um, and that's it. Thank you for tuning in. And thank you for anybody who watched live. Um, see if there's any comments I've missed. No. Cool. All right. Cheers. Catch you there, guys.